this talk is going to be uh, different to some of the other tutorials that were given. Uh, the, the idea that I had for this is essentially to give a very basic in programming talk so that those that have no um, experience in programming would be able to get up and going and write NMR simulation software that they would need for their projects. Um, one second. So, so basically, why, why would you bother? There's a lot of efficient programs like Simpson and Spin Evolution, W Solids, and, and so forth that you can download and use them uh, out of the box to do all sorts of different simulations of spectra and NMR experiments. Uh, but I found throughout all the work that I've done that not, a not insignificant fraction of, of the projects I've been involved with have required me to program some sort of NMR simulation software. Uh, here's just a few examples of things that I, I needed to do. Uh, for example, I, I wrote this program called Quest, which you can download from David Bryce's website, which allows you to simulate uh, NMR spectra for quadrupolar nuclei, including the effects of beyond second order um, quadrupolar interactions that become important when quadrupolar interactions is large. Uh, asymmetric J coupling tensors, uh, spin spin coupling interactions between quadrupoles. Simulating redor or restor curves in spin systems that have hundreds of spins, or uh, simulating DNP again in, in spin systems that involve hundreds or thousands of spins. So these are the types of things that that are not available in typical NMR simulation software. But depending on what you're doing, uh, you might need to to write software to do these types of simulations. Um, so the idea for for this talk essentially is I wrote a couple of bare bones. Uh, C slash C++ programs for the simulation of static and an MAS uh, NMR spectrum. And these are, I, I attempted to write these in as little code as possible. And you can uh, download and run them at these websites here. It's an online compiler. I, and I, I tried to write them in such a way that they would be easy to modify to suit uh, the needs of, of whoever wants to get into, into programming for NMR. So I'll just start off by introducing uh, the, the programming language C. Um, so the, the generally, so your program is written in these source files here that take the, the following format. So at the beginning, you include header files. So these are bits of, of source code that include functions that you can use uh, for your main program. And then your main C, uh, C file, uh, you have this function here, int main where within these curly braces, you include all of the uh, instructions that you want the program to carry out. So generally, you start off by first uh, declaring all the, all the different variables that you're going to use. And you need to, de to, to declare what type of variable it is. You then would have some lines to do a particular calculation. And at the end, you would return some integer number just to terminate this function and stop the program. Um, in C or C++, all your lines need to be terminated by a semicolon. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll go over these one at a time. So the, the variable types uh, that, that, that you can use are, so you would declare an integer number using int. Uh, a decimal number is called a floating point number. And you can declare this with float or double. Double is essentially has twice the number of bits, so you can you do more, uh, more precise calculations. Uh, you can also declare complex numbers. So there's many different ways to do this. But uh, the one that I generally use is this uh, standard complex um, nomenclature for declaring uh, complex numbers. This is how you would write it if you would have a complex double uh, precision floating point number. A car is used to, uh, to declare a single character. And uh, if you have a string, that would essentially in C be described as an array of cars. And again, and, and the last one is if you uh, are writing or reading from a file, uh, the last um, a declaration that you need is file, which is just the pointer, uh, which means the, the address on the disk where the file is located. Um, so the last thing is if you have an array of data, so like a vector or a matrix or a list, the way that you would declare it is you would, you, you would give the file the, the type of the variables. For example, so double, you'd write double. You give your variable a name, and then in square brackets, you would write the number of elements that this um, variable has. 
the indices uh, start at zero and they continue until uh, minus one of your of the number of elements that the array has. If you have a matrix, you would essentially have two sets of square brackets, um, or, or if you have a three-dimensional, then there's three sets of square brackets and so forth. Um, if you need to store very large arrays of data, so if you have matrices that, that have thousands or hundreds of components, then you may run into issues with uh, memory allocation. So you need to do something called dynamic memory allocation. In C++, this can be done all automatically if you just use the uh, standard vector uh, um, data structure. Uh, in, this, in, the, in the examples I'll be giving, I'm also using a library called Eigen, which is a, a linear algebra library that you can download for free. It's very easy to use. Uh, and there's these other um, variable declarations that I'll be using. So if you have a, a vector used in Eigen, you declare it as Eigen vector XD, which means that it's X dimensional and involves double precision point number. If it's a complex, it's CD. And there's the same sort of variable declarations for matrices. The last ones, you can also do Fourier transforms uh, using Eigen very easily. And this is the, the variable, that variable declaration you would use to declare a Fourier transform. Uh, in C, you can use the standard C libraries to do symbolic math operations. So for example, multiplications, additions, subtractions, and divisions. Uh, if, you, if you use Eigen, you can do the same sort of symbolic operations uh, on matrices, which is very convenient uh, for NMR calculations. And uh, the library also allows you to do uh, very easily, for example, matrix exponentiations, diagonalizations, uh, fast Fourier transforms, and so forth. Uh, so you don't need to code all of those things yourself. You just need to call the particular function. Uh, other examples of, of simple math operations would be you can do square roots, cosines, much of the same way that you would do them in Excel. Uh, this is how you would calculate uh, a power. So n to the power of exponent would be the power function, and you'd give those two variables inside the, the braces, the parentheses. Um, so, if, if you're, so of course, if you're writing a program, you want some way to input data and some way to output data. In C, the way that you typically would output data is with the printf function or print function. And so this is an example program that uses this. So uh, we start off here by, by including uh, standard C headers. And then in this main file, we'll declare uh, three floating point numbers, A, B, and C. A is, is declared as having a value of 20, B is two, and C is simply calculated as the multiplication of A and B. Then we, we, we call this printf function, and what it will do is it'll print out on the command prompt everything that you write in between these uh, uh, brackets here. Um, and so here it says, here is some text. Then there's slash n, so that's a particular code that, that sends it over to a new line. And then all of these different percent uh, letter uh, designations are calling particular uh, types of variables. So percent %f will be a floating point number. And after uh, the brackets is where you would write uh, all the different uh, values that go for these particular percent %f values. And so you can see here that it says, here is some text, goes to a new line, and then writes 20 times 2 equals 40. And so there, here is some text, new line, this will be 20, which is A, times, and then B equals uh, C. You can also um, uh, have your, your program read in data in much the same way as with the printf function using another family of functions, which are scanf. I don't use these, these in the example, uh, but I'm writing this here just so that you know them, you, so that you are aware of them. Uh, one of the most important things to know how to do is, of course, to write loops. Um, and a loop is essentially a little bit of code that gets repeated over and over again um, until a certain condition is met. So the most common one to use uh, that you'll see is the for loop. And the way that you, would, that, that you write this out is you write for, and then in parentheses, you write an initial condition, an end condition, and the increment that you want it to do, all of them separated in semicolons. And then in uh, uh, curly braces, you would write uh, the, the code that you wanted to perform at each of, the, of these increments. So here's a simple program here where we have a for loop, 
where we declare an integer i and then we, we loop over this integer i from a value of zero until the value is, is greater than 10. And then uh, and we increment uh, the loop i plus plus. So i plus plus is equivalent to just writing i equals i plus one. So we could have also written here i equals i plus one. And then at each increment in the loop, uh, we have it print out uh, an integer number, so that's percent %d, and then a new line. And so you'll see the command prompt here writes 0, 1 through 9, and then it terminates because the last one, i is no longer smaller than 10, so it does not execute the part of code. And uh, lastly, so we want to, another important thing is, is if statements, which execute a particular block of code when a, when a condition uh, is met. So, so for example, uh, this can be if a number is greater or lesser than something, if something is equal to a particular number or unequal to, you can also compare different strings. Um, and so here's an example code here, so we declare an integer i. Then we have a for loop where i goes from zero to two, so zero to less than three. And within this loop, we say that if i is less than one, it'll print the text i is small and then a new line. And if i is equal to one, it prints out i is medium. And if i is, or if both of these conditions uh, are false, it'll just print i is large. And so when you run the program, you see that uh, it just outputs i is small, i is medium, i is large, because it increments i in this loop. And then sequentially, it actually reaches each of these conditions at different um, iterations of the loop. Okay, so uh, so now now so th th that's essentially all the basics that you, you need to know to understand uh, the uh, NMR simulation programs that I wrote for this tutorial. And so I'm going to start off with just a, a minimalistic program for simulating a chemical shift on isotropy line shape. So the the program start starts off where we do a bunch of different variable declarations here. So we declare two integers, i and j, which are going to be used for loops. We declare some double precision floating point numbers for the anisotropy of the tensor, the asymmetry, and then Euler angles, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, this will be the chemical shift that is calculated. This will be the chemical shift outputted in the spectrum. And we also cal uh, store the cosine of beta directly, uh, which will be, become obvious later on. We declare two integer numbers, uh, beta steps and alpha steps. So this is the number of orientations that will be sampled in each of the different orientations. And then we declare two eigen uh, variables. So the first one is a complex double vector called uh, R2. So this is a spherical tensor for the uh, second rank spherical tensor part of the chemical shift tensor. And we have a complex double matrix uh, that we called uh, D past lab. So this is going to be a, a winger rotation matrix. So, so this is a five element vector, and this is a five by five matrix. So you can see here, we then assign the values for the uh, principal axis system of this um, uh, chemical shift tensor. And so the values that are written out here are essentially these values here. One thing to note is that while when we typically write out spherical tensors or winger rotation matrices, the uh, indices go from minus n to n, so here from minus two to two. When you go, when you, when you program in C or when you use Eigen, the indices go from zero to n minus one. And so here, R2 past zero corresponds to rho two minus two. Uh, the last part here is we declare the variables that will describe the spectrum. So the number of points, which is just set to 300. And then we declare an array, which is which we call a spectrum, which has 300 points. Um, and two variables that are called left max and right max, which are the edges of the spectrum. And we calculate the width of the spectrum just as the subtraction of the two. And then we start a loop here where with, we loop over i from zero to the number of points. And at each point, we initialize spectrum to having a value of zero. So unless you specify uh, a number when you declare a variable, it'll just be whatever is already on the disk. And so you need to first give initial values to your variables. And so 
we start off the spectrum at zero, zero throughout, and then we'll add intensity to the spectrum as the spectrum gets calculated. So before I keep going, uh, I need to introduce powder averaging. So in solids, the resonance frequency, frequencies are orientationally dependent, which means that if, you, that if you have a crystal, it'll have one sharp line, but if you rotate the crystal, uh, the sharp line will appear at a different chemical shift or a different resonance frequency. And when you have a powder, what you essentially have is just a statistical distribution of all of these different orientations. Um, and so the, the way, the way that, that you would then simulate the spectrum is you would loop over all these different orientations with the prop, uh, proper statistical probabilities, and you would sum all of these individual uh, crystallite orientations. So to represent these different orientations, we essentially effectively rotate the crystal, and we do this uh, using uh, Euler rotations. Uh, this is typically done uh, with three Euler angles, alpha, beta, and gamma. And in NMR, what, is most, uh, what you see the most often is people use the ZYZ convention. So what that means is you first grab the Z um, component of your tensor. You would rotate that by an angle of alpha uh, counterclockwise, or sorry, right-handed rotation. And then you would, uh, the, the new y-axis, you then rotate it, you rotate about that one by an angle of beta, and then again by the new z by an angle of gamma. Um, <clears throat> so the beta angle is the, the easiest one to understand, and it's generally the orientation between the main magnetic field and the z component of your tensor. Uh, the angles alpha and gamma uh, range from uh, 0 to 2 pi. They're more difficult to visually observe. Um, and beta ranges from 0 to pi. Um, I just wanted to make a, an, an extra note here is that you need to be careful when you work with Euler angles and when you report Euler angles in papers because if you don't define what your Euler angles mean, they essentially are meaningless because there's so many different conventions. People have used ZYZ convention or ZXZ convention. The rotations can either be active or passive. And just as an example, if you calculate an NMR spectrum with, for example, a quadrupolar and a CSA interaction, in Simpson, DM fit, or W solids, you will get a different powder pattern because the definitions of, the, of those Euler angles are different in the different programs. So you need to be aware of how the Euler angles are, are rotating your, your spin system. Um, so when, when we powder average, we can't just simply uh, loop over beta and alpha in a linear fashion because the different orientations have different uh, statistical probabilities. So if you look at this toy here, you'll notice that you can fit a lot more of these little spikes along the equator than you can uh, around the poles. And so these orientations are for, far more prob probable to occur. And so it's more probable to have a beta value of near 90 degrees than it is to have a beta value of zero or 180 degrees. And so generally, the probability of a, of a particular orientation being found in your sample depends on the sign uh, of beta. And so how you would write the powder averaging in the mathematical equation is essentially is you would integrate from 0 to 2 pi over both alpha and gamma, from 0 to pi over beta. So that's the range that those angles can, can go for. And the intensities of each of those orientations needs to be scaled by sine of beta. So in programming, what that means is you can either loop over each of these angles linearly, as this would suggest, and then scale all the intensities by sine of beta, or you can select a set of Euler angles that already has the proper probabilities so that you avoid oversampling certain orientations. So this is just an, an, a picture describing all the different uh, ways that people have tried to powder average samples. There's tons of different possibilities. Um, you'll see some familiar names here that some of you might know, like Z, ZCW or, or Repulsion, um, which, which have very nice and, and, and you know, coherent grids for, for different uh, Euler angles. Uh, in the examples that I wrote here, um, I'm just going to be using what's called spherical powder averaging, which is instead where you would loop over alpha in a linear way, and rather than looping over beta, we will loop over the cosine of beta, uh, 
and then calculate beta by the reverse cosine. So this still gives us the proper uh, statistical distribution. This does require more orientations to get a nice line shape than these other approaches, but it's the, it's the fastest way uh, to code the program in a, in a short form. The last point that I want to bring up is if you're going to be writing an NMR simulation software um, that, that, that you can calculate everything in the frequency domain, then probably what you'll want to do is instead of, doing, instead of using uh, orientation grids like this, what you'll want to use is interpolative powder averaging. And probably the most well-known and most widely, u widely used uh, interpolated powder averaging scheme is that of Alderman, Solomon, Grant. And it's, a little, it's, it's kind of ingenious for a couple of reasons. So rather than dividing up space in a sphere, you divide up space in the shape of an octahedron. And um, rather than calculating uh, so, what, so what you do is you divide space into an octahedron, and each face of the octahedron you divide up into these little triangles. And when you calculate the spectrum, you would calculate the NMR frequency at each of the vertices of these triangles, and then plot it out on the spectrum as a smooth line going between these three points as a triangle. So instead of adding infinitely sharp lines to one another in the spectrum, you add these triangles here that have intensity ranging from uh, both ends of the spectrum from both ends of where the frequencies occur. Uh, and so, so this means that you can calculate a smooth uh, powder pattern with far less orientations than you would if you were adding discrete, uh, infinitely sharp peaks. The other reason why this is a very ingenious way to do powder averaging is because of the triangular nature of this grid, you never need to calculate any sines or cosines. So calculating sines or cosines are very expensive uh, calculations to do uh, when you need to do them uh, in a large number of times like you would in, in a normal NMR simulation. And so if instead you can calculate all those sines and cosines by just using the ratios of the different indices of your, of your little triangles here, then that, that, gener that generates a far faster program because not only do you need to calculate less orientations, each orientation is in itself much, much faster to calculate. And the last point that I want to bring up uh, for powder averaging is that you also want to avoid unnecessary powder averaging. So there's this very nice flow chart here by this powder averaging uh, review article by Matthias Eden, where, which shows you essentially what, what part of space you need to, to average over. So if you only have one tensor, or if all your tensors are coincident uh, and axially symmetric, then you only need to average over the angle beta. The angle alpha does absolutely nothing. If, you're t if you have non-zero asymmetry, uh, but all your tensors are coincident, so what that means is your Euler angles are multiples of, of pi over two, then you only need to average over an octant of the sphere. So beta from zero to 90, alpha from zero to 90. And if you have multiple different tensors and they have their own principal axis systems, then you need to average over a hemisphere unless the angle gamma matters uh, which, for example, would be if you're simulating magic angle spinning, in which case you need to average over the full range of the sphere. So alpha and gamma from 0 to 2 pi and beta um, from 0 to 180. Okay, so I'll just continue over for this NMR, for this powder uh, line shape simulation program. So the next line is the powder averaging starts. So we're going to loop over cosine beta from 0 to 1. So this allows us to loop essentially beta from 0 to 90 in a statistically relevant way. And after, uh, within this loop, we then calculate the angle beta by calculating the reverse cosine. And then there's a second loop inside of this first loop where we loop over alpha, alpha from 0 to pi over 2. And at each step, uh, if you notice, we'll, so for example, for alpha, we loop each step, we increment alpha by pi over two divided by alpha steps. So, so it doesn't total alpha steps of alpha from zero to pi over two. Um, so we, the next thing that we do here is we call a function that will calculate the winger rotation matrix with angles alpha, beta, and gamma. And this is declared in this header file that I've also included uh, with the source files online. 
Uh, within the setter file, we also define the value of pi. So this is not a standard uh, C variable. So before I go, I, I move over to this winger complex file. Uh, I just want to introduce uh, tensors briefly. So there's two ways to, to represent uh, tensors in NMR that are, that are often used. So you can have your tensor represented in, in a Cartesian space, or you can, or you can use spherical tensors. Uh, and each of these tensors can be divided into three different parts. So you have the isotropic part. So this is the, essentially the, the part that remains uh, in isotropic liquids, so the isotropic chem chemical shift, the isotropic J-coupling. There's also an anti-symmetric part that seldom affects uh, NMR spectra, but you'll often see it affect uh, relaxation. So for example, the anti-symmetric part of the chemical shift tensor can surprisingly make T1 be longer than, sorry, T2 be longer than T1. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. So this is the part of the tensor that, that, that has this asymmetric um, organization. And then there's the symmetric part of the tensor, which has essentially in its principal axis frame only diagonal elements. Um, and so the part that I, that I wrote on the right here is essentially their representation in uh, spherical tensors. So in, in the Cartesian frame, they're all three by three matrices. The isotropic part has one element in a, in a spherical tensor, anti-symmetric has three, and the symmetric has five. Um, and if you're if you're doing if you're, uh, chemical shift calculations, uh, for example, the observable parts, the secular part, is always just the component that's parallel to the magnetic field, which in the uh, Cartesian tensor corresponds to this element, in the spherical tensor it is this element. So basically, to calculate the spectrum, all we need to do is rotate this matrix and calculate this element here, which will correspond to the uh, chemical shift for that orientation. Uh, the way that we do rotations for a Cartesian tensor uh, is by this way here. So you multiply it by a rotation matrix and it's transposed. This is uh, the Winger, uh, sorry, this is the ZYZ convention. Um, and for a Winger rotation matrix, you essentially, just, uh, sorry, for a spherical tensor, you would multiply it by a Winger rotation matrix. Uh, for the second rank tensors, uh, the Winger rotation matrix looks like such, so it's a five by five matrix. Each of the elements, uh, D2, Mn, takes the following form. So the alpha and the gamma dependence just depends on the uh, E to the I and then the index value and the, uh, and the angle. And the beta dependence is represented in what they call these reduced Winger rotation matrix elements. And these are the reduced winger rotation matrix elements for the second rank uh, tensor. You'll notice, for example, the middle one, so the, essentially the D200 element, is what is responsible for the averaging under matching angle spinning. Because if you, if you average uh, over the rotor phase, the uh, gamma and, and alpha dependence goes away. And so you're left with only this, this middle term, which averages um, to zero if you set beta to the magic angle. So all of these different uh, values for the, the reduced winger uh, rotation matrix coefficients are spelt out in this little d to mn uh, function that's in this header file. And this looks like this. So in the header file, so it has its own includes. Uh, we uh, define uh, the value of pi, which, which is used throughout the program outside of the functions. And uh, we also, have this, this line here using namespace, standard complex literals. All this does is it means that we can use one i to represent uh, square root of minus one. So, for, so, so that we can uh, do symbolic operations uh, involving complex numbers. So in this D2MN function here, you'll just notice that all it is is a series of if and else if statements that checks whether the values of n and m correspond to a particular set. And for example, if you have n and m of two, it'll, it'll execute this line of code here, which just returns the value of one plus cos beta squared over four, which would correspond to um, this matrix element here. And so it does this for every value of m and n. The way that you would call this, so the function is declared as d2mn, an integer for m, an integer for n, and a double for beta. Uh, 
And so when you call this, if you if you'd write out D2MN and then parentheses 2, 1, beta, it'll just uh, return this value directly for what this operation is. In this header file, we also I also included two functions, one to calculate the matrix element for the full winger rotation matrix, and the other one which just returns the matrix itself. Uh, so, so this large D2MN function just returns the result from the first function, so D2MN of beta, and then uh, uses Euler's formula here to include the alpha and gamma dependence. So we have cos of minus alpha M minus gamma N, and then we use this complex literal 1i to represent this imaginary number here. And the last function here, um, the data structure for this one is an eigen um, matrix. So it'll return an eigen uh, formatted matrix. And all that you have in this function here is it loops over the different uh, matrix elements for the winger rotation matrix and assigns them to this matrix D2, which is declared up here. And then at the end, it just returns the full matrix. So if we go back to the main program here, uh, what we have here, so earlier we declared this winger rotation matrix here. When you call this, this uh, function here, D2 matrix alpha, beta, gamma, it calculates the full winger rotation matrix and assigns it to uh, this variable here. And then to calculate the uh, spherical tensor in the, in the lab frame, all we have to do is multiply this winger rotation matrix with the spherical tensor in, in the principal axis frame uh, to rotate uh, that vector. And we end up, uh, and then we can calculate the chemical shift using the central element of this uh, vector, which is calculated as such. So two over root six R two zero, which is what is done here. So two over square root of six. Uh, and then the real value of R two, since R two was, was defined as a complex number. Um, so I just want to add an extra note here. Uh, the way that I've written this program is essentially to have it be the clearest uh, depiction and the easiest way for the program to be modified to suit whatever needs that you might have. But it, if, you're, if you're interested in writing uh, efficient codes, what you'll want to do is these whole operations here, you'll want to condense them in as short a form as possible to limit the number of mathematical operations that you need to do. So for example, the calculation of this full matrix here and this rotation could instead be done with this formula here, which has far less operations to do. And you can also additionally pre-compute all your sines and cosines so that you don't have to calculate those on the fly. So at the end, so after the chemical shift for that particular orientation, VCS is calculated, we then enter another loop here which loops over, from, uh, over the number of points of the spectrum, so I from zero to NP. And at each of these orientations, we calculate uh, what would be the chemical shift for that data point, starting from the right edge. Uh, sorry, starting from, yeah. So we have the right maximum here, and then uh, we add I times the width divided by the number of points. So that's just the spacing between the data points. And then we check with an if statement if this chemical shift is smaller than this calculated value of the shift. If so, then this orientation generates intensity within this particular bin of a histogram, and we add a value of one to that um, element in the array spectrum here. And then, so if again, again, if that condition is true, we break the loop, and then it goes over back to the top to calculate the next orientation. So then at each orientation, we calculate the chemical shift, then we find out where on the spectrum it lies, and then we add a value of one to that position on the spectrum. And so at the end here, um, the last thing that we need to do is we need to output the spectrum. So once all the loops are done, we've calculated all of the, all the different orientations. We then declare a pointer here, so file that we call FP for file pointer or FredPra. And uh, we open the file. So you do this by doing FP equals F open. You give the file a file name, and then here uh, we, we put W for write. If you're reading a file, this would be R. And then we do the same loop that we did earlier when figuring out where on the spectrum a particular orientation would contribute. 
except that here we just loop over the data points, calculate the shift, and then use the file printf function to print this string here to the file, so percent %f, comma, percent %f, and new line. All this will do is it will print out the value of the shift, the intensity of the spectrum separated by a comma. And so this is essentially just a comma delimited file, so Excel can read it natively. And at the end, you just close the file and terminate the program. And so then, so if you run this program, you'll, you'll generate this file spec.csv. And if you open it in Excel, you can plot it, and you can see the spectrum that, that this little program calculates. Um, so the, the, the line shape is jagged. If you'd want to get a smoother line shape, you'd have to either apply some line broadening or calculate more orientations by increasing alpha steps and beta steps. Uh, alternatively, you could just use interpolated powder averaging instead of this step-by-step -step, uh, powder averaging. So before I, I move on to the next part, which will be magic angle spinning, uh, maybe I can take a few questions. Um, yes. Uh, so very, very, very interesting. I was so impressed. Um, so I can start with the first question um, from the beginning of the talk. Someone asked, why does one need to scale with uh, sine of beta for, for powder averaging? So the, 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 yeah, so the reason you need to scale with sine beta is because, so if I go back, so beta is the orientation between the main magnetic field and the principal, uh, the largest component of your tensor. And so if you have it being parallel to the magnetic field, it's, it's, that's a very improbable orientation for it to have. So if you look here, if instead you have a beta of 90, it's a lot more probable, there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more surface essentially in that in that region of the sphere, and essentially the probability distribution that describes this is is sine of beta. So you have zero probability of beta being zero, and you have maximum probability of beta being ninety degrees. Yeah, um, and then someone else asked, "What is gamma compute?" Um, so ga gamma compute is a particular uh, scheme that was developed, I think, by Matthias Eden for speeding up calculations where you, you, your propagator is um, repetitive. So I'm not, I'm not going to go over this. Uh, this is something that you'd have to, to, to program yourself. You'd be interested. Um, I've, never, I've never programmed it myself, to be honest. And someone else asked, how does one define limits in interpolative power averaging? Um, um, so the limits, so if, um, okay, if I go here to, so, uh, so I had this flow chart here. So for example, if, if you have this condition here where you have one tensor and you only need to average over um, one octant of the sphere. So with this alderman solemn grand powder averaging scheme, what this means is you only need to do to powder average over one face of this octahedron. And the way that you would define the limits is you would define the, the number of, um, of triangle faces along e at each edge. So here you'd, you'd have like an N of four, and you would calculate all the vertices between these different triangles. And so you can increase the, the amount of powder averaging by increasing um, the number of triangles that you're dividing this, this triangle into, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. And so, so that here, when you, when you do this style of powder averaging, you would just label each of these vertices uh, in, in, these, in these three, sorry, you, you would label these indices in, in a two-dimensional way uh, in an array um, and you would loop over. So, for example, here you would have uh, the this the the dimensionality in this direction going from zero to three. Uh, so you'd have, or I guess zero to five. So this would be zero, one, two, three, five, and you have the same thing in the other direction. Okay. And then someone else asked that when can we get away with just comma angle averaging? Uh, gamma sorry, angle where? average. Uh, the last one. When can we get uh, get away with gamma angle averaging? 
So if you're simulating a static line shape, then you don't need to to average over gamma. The you know the the the, the spectrum doesn't depend on the angle gamma. You essentially you, well you need it when you're doing magic angle spinning simulations where it effectively it represents the initial phase of your rotor. Um, yeah. Another question. I think you explained this in the talk, but um, maybe you don't mind repeating it. Can you explain difference between frequency and time domain calculation? Yeah. So the, the next example that I'll show is a time domain calculation. Uh, generally, so the frequency domain is if you ca if you calculate the chemical shift or you calculate the, the resonance frequency directly um, on the spectrum, then you can just build the spectrum directly from that. That's, much, that's a much faster way to calculate a spectrum. Uh, time domain, you would need to run time domain calculations if you're calculating something like, um, like an NMR experiment or, or an example I'm gonna give is magic angle spinning, which you can calculate in the, in the fre frequency domain also. Uh, but most often you would do it in, in the time domain. And there what you do is instead of calculating the spectrum, you calculate the free induction decay, and then you would get the spectrum by applying a Fourier transform. Yeah. And I think a uh, last question is a general question from Raj, uh, that uh, what would you say are the advantage and disadvantage of using C, C++ for NMR programming versus other coding languages like Python? Yeah. So. Uh, if you're using compiled languages like C, C++, or Fortran, the programs will run a lot faster uh, because you, you, you would first compile the code, and that code can be optimized by the compiler, uh, whereas languages like Python or Java uh, don't, don't get compiled, so they instead use something called an interpreter, where instead of, of having a pre-compiled program that's already been optimized, it's working on your program line by line. Um, and so for, for doing things like loops, uh, interpreted languages tend to be uh, much slower. In Python, I know there's, you, you can write, for example, C or C++ chunks of the code and then have Python manage your program, which is a very popular way of, of, of doing it. I've never uh, programmed this way. Um, I've never had any issues with, uh, with C or C++, but it's not. It, I, I find it's a nice language because you can you can write graphical programs with it, and it's very fast. And there's a lot of of resources available for doing uh, math operations, which is convenient for NMR. Yeah. But I think the main the main difference just boils down to speed. And so if you learn a, a, a compiled language, you'll be able to run larger calculations. Um, another question just popped up. Uh, what does the numbers in the interpolative scheme mean? In the end, we just need uh, averaging over angles. Um, so in the interpolated scheme, you don't actually use angles. So you don't, you don't actually need the angles. What you need are the sign, you need the directional cosines. So you need the signs and the, and the and the cosines of those angles. Um, so, so in this case here, so the different vertices will have different indices, uh, which are related to the angle, but you can use them directly to calculate the cosine or the sine that you need instead of, instead of working with the angles. Um, with, so while in the example that I'm giving, you know, the, 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 the orientational scheme already had the correct sine beta dependence, this alderman Salm grant uh, scheme does not, and so you do need to scale the intensities at each step as well, according to sine beta. But there's there's again a simple arithmetic uh, operation to calculate what the intensity is going to be. Okay, we are out of questions. Um, we can okay. move on, and then we ask question later. Okay, so the the second part uh, of the talk is. I'll just be going over the uh, the same program here, but I've added match angle spinning and convert it into a time domain calculation. So those that are interested in running uh, in writing programs to do time domain calculations, maybe this will be a useful template uh, to use. So I'll just highlight the differences that 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 arrive in the program. So first is I included an extra header file, which is the header file for Eigen that includes the Fourier transform. Uh, there's two extra integers here, 
one to do an extra loop and the other one for time. Uh, because we're doing magic angle spinning, uh, as mentioned uh, in response to an earlier question, we also need to average over gamma. So I, I included this gamma steps integer here. And there's parameters that are needed to do magic angle spinning. So I calculate the magic angle and define the spinning frequency a WR for omega R. Um, because we're doing MAS, we need to do two sequential rotations. So I define two winger rotation matrices. So to go from the principal axis frame to the uh, rotor frame, and then from the rotor frame to the lab frame. The, the principal axis frame uh, spherical tensor is defined in the same way. Uh, the uh, spectral, uh, the, the, spect the spectral width is defined in the usual way for Fourier transform in MR. So we have a dwell time, lawnmower frequency, and the width is essentially calculated uh, in the usual way. And uh, the last thing is because we'll be do using a eigen function to do the Fourier transform, we need to define the free induction decay and the spectrum as eigen uh, complex vectors. And so here we define the FID as a uh, vector complex double. It has NP uh, points. Uh, and we also define another one called total FID. So this one will be used to sum the FID of the different orientations, whereas the first one will be used to calculate the FID for a single orientation. Um, and then here we set, uh, we use this, this eigen function here, which essentially zeros all the elements of the FID. That's analogous to the, in the earlier program, I ran a loop to zero all the elements of the array spectrum. Uh, using this function here for eigen does the same thing. It just sets all the, all the values to zero. And then the, we set the first element of the FID to uh, the number of orientations just because we're not gonna be calculating the first element of the FID, so we need to give it a value. Uh, and then the spectrum is defined, uh, again, as a complex double uh, vector using eigen. Okay, so this is where the powder averaging starts. So you'll notice here we, di we did some changes because that we're doing magic angle spinning, we now need to loop over beta from zero to pi, and we need to loop over alpha and gamma from zero to two pi. So the way that we do this is we loop cos beta from minus one to plus one, and then again calculate beta by doing the reverse cosine. And then we have two uh, loops nested within this one that loop alpha and gamma from zero to two pi uh, in alpha and gamma steps. Uh, so inside this loop is where we start the calculation of the FID. So we set the FID for that orientation to zero and the first data point to one. And then um, we have a fourth loop here. So you'll notice that for the frequency domain calculation, we only needed to have two nested loops. For the time domain calculation, we need to do four loops. So this is a more expensive calculation. Uh, and we loop uh, time from zero to NP. Uh, sorry, from one to NP, the, the, the first element is already calculated. Um, and within this time loop, we do the same sort of thing that we did earlier. So we calculate the winger rotation matrix for, or, for alpha, beta, and gamma. And then we have the second winger, uh, winger rotation matrix, which is used to rotate the rotor. And so we rotate it at a rate of omega, of, uh, of omega r. So the, so the rotor phase is effectively omega r times time times the dwell time. And the angle uh, beta here is defined as the magic angle. So effectively, uh, the, uh, what, what the rotation this that this does is you first rotate uh, by alpha, sorry, by omega RT. So the, the rotor is effectively rotated uh, parallel to Z, and then you dip it at the magic angle, effectively doing this rotation about the magic angle. Um, and then we calculate, again, the uh, instantaneous frequency uh, as we did earlier, uh, except now we're, we're converting it into angular frequency units. Uh, and then uh, the FID is simply advanced uh, by the instantaneous frequency that we calculate here, uh, again using uh, Euler's uh, formula. So we're essentially just advancing the FID 
uh, for this for the, the period of the dwell time by the frequency uh, of the chemical shift of that instantaneous chemical shift. Um, and then uh, once this is done, we add the intensity of that of that data point in the FID to total FID, um, which is we're we're just adding the different FIDs together. So after these loops are done, uh, we need to do the Fourier transform of the spectrum. So we define a variable for the Fourier transform using Eigen. And then this function here, fft.forward, uh, does the Fourier transform of the FID total FID and stores the result in spectrum. And then uh, in much the same way that we did earlier, we write out the spectrum in a comma delimited file uh, that's called spec.csv, which we open here. And then uh, this looks a little bit weird, but the reason why is when you do the Fourier transform, uh, it orders the data points in a way that is, uh, that, that is different than you would think. So the ordering of the data, the, the data points is as such. So the first data point in the spectrum is in the, metal, the middle of the spectrum, and then they increase moving towards higher frequency. And then when you reach NP2 minus one, NP over two minus one, the next data point corresponds to the maximum right edge of the spectrum, so the lowest frequency point, and then it moves towards the middle. Um, that's just the way that it gets output when you uh, use this function. So to write out the spectrum, we need to do two loops. So starting at this right edge here, uh, we, we loop from NP over 2 to NP, and then we again calculate the shift in much the same way that we did before. And then we print out three numbers to this file, the shift, and then the, the spectrum is, uh, has both a real and imaginary component. We can print out both of these uh, by specifying the real part of the spectrum for data point I and the imaginary part of the spectrum for data point I. And then we increase uh, this integer K using K++, and this is used in this calculation here for the chemical shift. And so once we've, we've done this part here of outputting the spectrum, this loop ends, and then we go back to the second loop here where we start at value of zero and go from NP over minus, uh, divided by two minus one and uh, continue outputting the spectrum with the chemical shift calculating, calculated using this expression here. And then we close the file. Um, and then for good measure, we can also print out the FID. So you can create a second file called uh, FID.csv and then we can print out um, the uh, time variable, which is just calculated, sorry, by I times the dwell time, because we're looping over I. Uh, and then we can print out the real and the imaginary part of the FID and close this file. So if you open these files in Excel, you'll get this uh, matching angle spinning spectrum here, showing the spinning sidebands for this CSA powder pattern. And you can open the FID file as well, where you can see uh, what the FID looks like. Uh, so before I end this talk, uh, so th these were two very minimalistic programs. I tried to write them in as, as, as little lines as possible. But if you're gonna be uh, writing your own programs and, and you might be distributing these, uh, there's some additional notes that you might wanna consider for writing efficient code. Uh, you wanna use libraries as much as possible. Um, Never write matrix multiplications yourself. You will never write a matrix multiplication that will be faster than what you can do with, with uh, things like uh, LAPAC or Eigen. And the same thing goes for uh, doing matrix diagonalizations. And you can also uh, look for other things that might be useful for writing programs. So for example, uh, in this program that, that, that I wrote, Quest, which is a graphical program for simulating um, quadrupolar line shapes uh, in exact cases. I use a library called QWT, which takes care of all the plotting, so it's, it's very easy to do. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you want to simplify your equations as much as possible, condense them in, in the smallest form so that the, uh, the calculations run faster. And uh, generally, what I would do is I would calculate all the sines and cosines once uh, so that you, you you don't need to calculate them at each iteration. So you can just store directly the sines and the cosines. You want to avoid doing if statements as much as possible. So if statements are quite slow, 
so you want to write your code in a way that will execute the most probable if statements first. Uh, so that so that you you minimize the number of this of if calls that it does. In some cases, you can also you can also instead use something called a switch, which essentially instead of having if and else if statements, you write down a list of possible options, and it just goes directly to the option uh, that you're looking for. Uh, you want to turn on optimization in your comp in your compiler, particularly if you're using Eigen. So this is this is done with this uh, dash O3 option, or if you're using an IDE. Um, so, like a graphical uh, programming interface, like code blocks. There's compiler options, and you can just checkbox all the ones that you want. So you can checkbox O3. Um, you'd also want to parallelize your code. So SolidState and MR code is very easy to parallelize because each calculation of a different orientation can be done independently. So you can just parallelize the code over different orientation, so that different uh, different processors or working on a different orientation of your powder average. And then you can add up all the different spectra from those different processors at the end. Um, there, if you look up uh, something called OpenMP, um, th th this essentially in C and uh, Fortran allows you to parallelize a for loop with a single line of code. So this is uh, very easy to do and you can easily speed up your code by four or eight times uh, depending on the number of processors in your computer. If you're running a lot, a lot of uh, large calculations that you're running on a cluster, you'd want to look into parallelizing with MPI, uh, which allows you to parallelize on different nodes as well. And lastly, uh, like someone mentioned, um, you'll want to use the faster algorithms. So if you're, if you're doing calculations in the frequency domain, uh, use this, this interpolated scheme of Alderman, Solomon, Grant. And if you're doing uh, time domain cal uh, calculations, you can reuse. You can take advantage of periodicity and reuse propagators, or you can look at uh, things like the compute or gamma compute uh, algorithms. So that that is the end of the talk or the tutorial. Uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that people might have. I'm waiting for the questions to pop up. Yeah. It could be um, that they were answered in the first yeah. part. Yeah, they, I think they asked most of the question in the first part. Oh, I got one. How can one do simulations of larger spin, larger spin system? Yeah, so th this is where you have to get creative uh, with how you're writing your program. So I recently uh, wrote a code that allows us to do DNP simulations and spin systems that have a few thousand spins. And there, uh, we're doing the calculations in Louisville space. Uh, and the advantage there is that instead of writing your density matrix, so your density matrix in Hilbert space is, is written out uh, into the list of possible states that you have. So for, for example, alpha or beta, or if you have two spins, alpha, 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 beta, and so forth. In Louisville space, your basis functions are operators. And so then you can define things like IZ, 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 I plus, I minus, and so forth. And then you can cut it off uh, to only include operators that involve fewer spins. Uh, and those generally have a larger influence on the observable properties of, of, of an NMR experiment. And so you can drastically reduce the size of your density matrix in that way. Um, for programming them, um, in, in, so you, you, you have to be cl uh, clever with how you're organizing your data structures. Because, you know, even, even if you do all these tricks, you know, you're still left with something where, you know, your, your density matrix has a million elements. Um, and so your Louvillian would have a million by a million elements. So obviously you can't store the Louvillian on the disk. Uh, so what, what, I, what I was doing is you cal I'm using this um, a scheme called the Suzuki Trotter uh, approximation where we, instead of propagating over the whole Lavillian, we do one interaction at a time on a small subset of the larger uh, density matrix. Uh, so, so each of the calculations is, is quite small. And then the, you have to be clever with how you store the variables on the disk. And so if you can't just store it as a simple array because you'll, you'll very quickly run out of memory store, storing a bunch of zeros. And so you need to look into sparse uh, data structures. 
the way that I that I was doing this was using uh, something called a hash uh, script or hash function, which essentially is, is like a way of storing an array, except that you only store the elements that you're going to use. And so everything in between, so let's say if we have like a four element array, but we only have non-zero numbers in elements one and three, then we would only store elements one and three. And then the program uses a special function that finds out where that element is stored on the disk. And all that yeah. is done automatically. So in C++, you, it's just a different variable declaration. Instead of declaring it as a double, you, you declare it as an unsigned list or something like this, and then you, you work with it as though it was an array. Yeah. Um, very smart way of storing the data without running it out of the space. Um, I think I'm done with the questions. Oh, no, <laughs> two more. Uh, is it possible to share a simple example of such a code? Um, sure. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm writing on a sort of upgrade. I'm working on a, on a sort of upgrade to that, to that paper that we just published. Um, I do want to distribute the code after that is out. I'll need to clean it up because I, I'm, I tend to be a pretty messy programmer. And so I, for it to be readable by other people than myself, I, I would need to put a little bit of work into it. Um, the next question is of some sort of DNP related. They ask uh, for the simulation of DNP sweep for profile, how many electrons can be included? So the program that I wrote uh, previously, um, I only coded it in such a way that would accept one or two electrons. But um, in, in principle, there, there's no limit. You can add as many, as many mm -hmm. electrons as you want. So if you use this, this uh, Landau-Zenner trick that was developed uh, by um, Kent Thurber, as well as, as Fred Mintig-Vigier somewhat simultaneously, um, you don't, you don't, the, the, the electrons add very little to the calculation of, of the, of the DNP enhancements. And so you can add as many as you want and there's virtually no cost. 